Hello again and welcome to A Closer Look with Mark Shine and myself, Mark Miller. And Mark, this week it's all about tournament basketball. It's district for the guys, it's regionals for the ladies, it's a big week. All right, let's get started. As most tournament games or weeks provide us some great plays, Mark has picked out a few. Let's go over plays of the week. Well, first of all, Mark, we're just going to let this one run. This is Jackson Center and Fairlawn from last week down at Piqua. And let's just watch Jackson. And we're going to take a chance to look at this twice. They're going to throw 13 passes in this one possession. They're going to go high post. They're going to go left side. They're going to go top of the circle. And people talk about, you know, basketball and, and we need a shot clock. Watch how they execute their offense and how this ends up. Here the ball's been left. It's been right to begin with. Now it goes left again. We look at the post for Wildermuth. We get this pass right here. Here's a back screen. We look at this. But look, they're always looking for an opportunity to score and watch how it ends. Here's a screen and here's the lob pass down inside and number 44 for Fairlawn. He's so tired of chasing Brady <laughs> Wildermuth around. Brady gets a basket. And we're going to look at it again just quickly. This is an offense that, you know, we've joked about the name of it. Actually came from Clemson. It's called the Tiger Paws, and they spelled it P-A-U-S-E for Clemson Tiger and Paws. But this Jackson Center runs it. They're a Tiger, too. I guess that fits. But just the execution of this, how they're looking for scoring opportunities. They obviously want to get the ball to Brady Wilmermuth. He is their leading scorer. He's 34 down the box right here. Here's a back screen he sets. That pops him open. But the point is, they're going to run their offense till they get the look they want. Here's the back cut right there. There's the lob. And that's a big basketball game, a really good basketball game with 13 passes to get a score. And then at the other end, number 42, Calvin Winter, the freshman, is going to make two big plays. There's a steal in the lane. He just steps in right there and makes that steal. If we go back just a little bit, we'll catch the end of the previous play. And we'll set up what, what Winter does. Here's the back screen again. I ran it back a little bit too far. My mistake on that. But let's watch Winter, the freshman, down at the other end. And we're going to get him right here. He's right in the lane right here. He's going to follow. He's right over here playing his guy. And watch how he reads the play and then steps right in the lane right here to make a steal off his guy. Big play. Then he's going to do the same type of thing on the next play. The game is almost over. He's right here right now. Watch him help and recover. Get his hand in the passing lane right there and get a steal. This helps seal a win for a Jackson Center team that's playing very well right now. They beat of Fairline, who had beaten them twice in a regular season, and a great play by him. Well, here's the next play we're going to look at as we go move now to our bright spot. This is something you don't see very often. Again, it's Brady Wildermuth down in Pickwa in the districts, the game that Mark was just talking about. But he does something that players typically don't do. See the ball bouncing out of bounds? He goes and gets it. But he doesn't just leave it there. He goes over and hands it to the official. Now, that might seem like a very minor thing. But if it's so minor, why don't more players do that? Exactly. That is good sportsmanship. That's helping the referee out. It's interest. It's a lot of positive things that Brady Wildermuth they exhibited and, right there. And I know officials appreciate that. And not that you're going to get a call because you do it, but officials appreciate players who show sportsmanship. And we know what? We see a lot of that in the SCAL. Stan Evans and his guys really preach sportsmanship. That's a good thing right there. You know, Division Three football, I had, two, I had a son that played there, and there is a rule that when you score a touchdown, you have to go hand the ball to the official in the end zone. Yeah. No celebrating, no jumping up and down. Until you hand the ball, then you can celebrate with your team or you'll get a penalty flag. I love that. If they can force Division three guys to do it, yeah. they could do it at every division. We don't allow to have to let them show themselves off. You know, I do some officiating high school basketball. And when we get together with a captain, I always point to my partner and say, he's getting kind of old. Make sure you get the ball there back to him. Go. You want it doesn't work well? when your partner's a female. That didn't go very well in that I did there. Hey, we got a couple other bright spots too. We've been trying to track milestones this year. The first is Paul Wayne, now at Tenora, longtime coach at Holgate. Paul won his 500th game last week in their first tournament game, and that's quite an accomplishment for him. I did some graduate games. classes with Paul at Bowling Green State University a long time ago. I think he set the record at BGSU for most parking tickets accumulated in a summer course. <laughs> but he, good basketball coach, we always enjoyed Paul. And Kyle Nunn from Finley. Kyle Nunn scored his 1,000th point last weekend. We know he's, he's a football player, right? Going to Pitt on a, on a D1 football scholarship, probably as a defensive back. But congratulations again. We track guys and, and people who uh, come up with some milestones this year. And, and Paul Wayne and Kyle Nunn, a couple of milestones for them. All right. Where are they now segment? Yeah. And Mark Shine's going to tell us about Travis Walton. How about Travis Walton? You know, this is one of my favorite players in Lima senior history. He graduated in 2005, played 86 games for the Spartans over four years there. He was a player of the year in Northwest Ohio in 2005, his senior year. 
he goes on to, and obviously had great records there. They were 19 and 4 his senior year, 18 and 5 the year before that. We don't think of him, though, as a scorer. We think of him as two other areas, even though he had 1,076 points in his career. He goes to Michigan State University, and when I think of Travis Walden, we think defensive player and we think leader and exemplify both of those. There are only three players in the history of Michigan State basketball who have been captains for three years. Travis Walton is one of them. He goes on to become Defensive Player of the Year in the nation, in the Big Ten, I should say, his senior year. Tremendous defensive player, great stopper. He's already, I think he ranks highest on, uh, or in career steals or something like that. He's played 143 games for the Spartans. His senior year, they go off to the national tournament. They get all the way to the finals. Defeated University of Connecticut in the semifinals. Lost to North Carolina in the finals right down the road from MSU in Detroit. A great year, a great career for Travis Walton. What's he do then? He goes into the NBA Development League, played four years there. What's he doing today? Travis Walton is now an assistant coach with the Salt Lake City All-Stars in the Developmental League. They're having a really good year. They're an affiliate, obviously, with the uh, Utah Jazz. The thing I like most about Travis, every year he comes back to Lima. Every year he puts a camp or a clinic on for young players, giving back to people in the community. His dad, Nate, great player as well. I used to work at the Lima YMCA. Travis would be down there working on his game with Nate, not just down there fooling around, but working on his game when he was in high school. A couple of great guys, Nate Walton, but especially Travis Walton, and congratulations to Travis. All right, good job, Mark. What a player. Yes, hey, is. let's preview our tournament games now, and I'm going to go first. I've got the Wapak <laughs> Districts Division Four. Perry, 20 and 3, takes on Minster, 12 and 9. This is a game you wanted to it see. Is, it is. We'll be there. I think it's a battle of tempo. That ought to be the title of this one. Perry beat Ridgemont 80 to 31. They have won 16 in a row. They've not lost a game in 2017. December 28 was their last loss, and they average, believe this or not, 79 points a game. They get up and down the floor. Minster, they beat Temple Christian 54-48. They average 56 points a game, 79-56. Do the math. That's why it's a game of tempo. Who wins it? Up tempo, advantage Perry. Slow it down, advantage Minster. The other game, the nightcap, St. Henry at 15-9 against Fort Recovery, 16-7. Of course, a rematch from regular season. They're both in the MAC. Fort Recovery won that game 51-46 on January 6th. St. Henry, to get there, beat Waynesfield, Goshen, and USV. They have three overtime victories on the roster on their schedule this year. So if we get down toward, toward it, it'll be old territory for them. Uh, Fort Recovery beat New Bremen comfortably. They have five wins in a row, and they played a four overtime game against Minster. So if it comes down to a final shot, <laughs> both of these teams have been there. Should be a fun night. You know what else I like about that? Do a little bit of research on that. In that game you talked about, St. Henry had 10 three-point field goals made. There's 30 out of their 46 points and wow. lost. Wow. All right. I have the Elida District. They also play on Tuesday night. We start out with Kaleida and Crestview in that one. Um, Kaleida is 12 and 12 on the season. Had a good tournament run so far. They beat Fort Jennings and upset Miller City. They got it going a little bit. Crestview we followed all year long. They beat Lincoln View for the second time. They're going to match up in, uh, in that game. And obviously Crestview is going to be favored. But the way Kaleida is playing right now, that could well go in the favor of uh, the, the Wildcats from Kaleida. We'll see what happens with that one. The other game, Delphi St. John's and Continental, that's a rematch of a game that took place in the last weekend of the season, and Delphi St. John's won. How did they get to this particular point? Well, St. John's beat Corey Rosson uh, by 51-36. Jared Wurst had 15 with five threes. I got the math on that one. Five threes <laughs> equals 15. And Continental's got two five-point wins over Lipsick and over Ottoville. So, Game matchup in the regular season, Delphi St. John's won 52-43. If it gets to be a number one seed, that would be St. John's against the number two seed, Crestview. They played on December 30th. Crestview won that game at Delphi St. John's 50-48. If it gets to that point, look for another close one at the Elida Fieldhouse. That would be a great one. Tomorrow night at Ohio Northern University, Division II, Upper Sandusky. Hey, how'd they get in the WBL to yeah. tournament? <laughs> they are 23-0, yeah. even though their website keeps saying 24-0. Oh, it's a little presumptuous. They're going to play Wapak 21-2 in the first game. Upper beat Kenton 68-67. Boy, they barely got away from that one. They have lost their point guard, but they are still very good with lots of firepower, an excellent team. Wapak beat Defiance 44-42 in overtime, so they both had really tight ones the first round. Nick Schoonover made first team all WBL, but they have a lot of other scores. You really cannot concentrate on one through eight because they have had so many leading scores. That should be a nice matchup. And then in the nightcap, Ottawa Glandorf, 21 and two, the WBL champions against Elida, 14 and eight. OG beat Bryan by about 15. Jay Kaufman is a WBL player of the year. 
Elida beat Van Wert 61-58. Daniel Unruh, first team WBL, he had 32 points on 12 of 14 shooting, and they weren't all layups. Yeah, He's right. not six foot 11. <laughs> Regular season game February 17, OG 45, Elida 34. Interesting in this district, all four teams left had a first round bye, so they've all only played one tournament game so far, and they're in the districts. I think Wapak's happy not to have to play another WBL school. I think I, so. I think they're happy. Let's go play somebody we somebody haven't played new. yet. I, I think that's a good move for them. Let's go to the D3 tournament that's played up at Napoleon. This is the game we lobbied for back in the last mm -hmm. week, the last several weeks to get. Van Buren again matches up with Liberty Benton. This is a number one, three, number one seed, Liberty Benton, the number three seed, Van Buren. Each team is 20 and three. Why did we lobby for this one? Because Mark and I did this game in the regular season back on January 6th. And Liberty Benton won 63-58 in overtime. Anthony Mastrolasco had 46 that night. Uh, Ayers had 15. Fasoni had 13. Turner had 13 um, for, for Van Buren. And we keep talking about, yeah, well, Fasoni was in foul trouble. Adolph didn't get to play. But there's another stat we ought to look at that may well favor the Eagles, and that is Liberty Benton did not make a three-point field goal in that game. And that's something they can do pretty well, at least percentage-wise. We'll see if how that particular game plays out. The winner will get the number two seed, Archibald. They're 18 and five against Elmwood, the four seed. They're 15 and eight. Here's an interesting thing. Should it come down to that, Elmwood beat Liberty Benton 65, 47 back on February 27th. They, Elmwood has a guy named Taylor Lentz, who is, or Tate Lentz, excuse me, 6'4", over a thousand points, a really solid player. Let's see if Archibald can beat them. If not, they get the winner of LB and VB, and I'm looking forward to that on Thursday oh, it'll night. it'll be a lot of fun. Let's go to Lima Senior now, the Division Three district. Spencerville, 18 and five against Marion Local, 14 and eight. Spencerville beat Delphus Jefferson in a pretty close game, 63-58. They have the Northwest Conference Player of the Year in Dakota Pritchard. Marion Local, they beat Allen East, 64-46. They have Tyler Mesher inside. First team, MAC Conference, in a regular season game, Spencerville won 58 to 55. Wayne Trace and Bluffton in the other matchup. Wayne Trace is 21 and two. Bluffton came out of regular season 11-11, won two tournament games. Wayne Trace got over Parkway by 18, and Ethan Linder had 52 points in three quarters. How about that? Yeah. Bluffton, they beat Coldwater by one, and then came back and beat Carey by 11 to get into this. And Mark, we got a couple of minutes to talk about the Tri-Village and yeah. Jackson Center and all that stuff. Let's go through the Southwest District as quickly as we can. First of all, Jackson Center will match up with Tri-Village. We've covered Jackson Center a lot. They're really coming on. Brady Wildermuth, Sosby, they're really coming along. We saw what Winter did in our highlight show. We don't know much about Tri-Village. Well, let's look at what happened down there with those guys. They lost four players for disciplinary reasons for four games during the middle part of the season, and they lost all four of their games. They've got those guys back. Their record's a little bit deceiving. Uh, since that time, they have two losses. Versailles, they're pretty good. Yeah. Bethel, they're pretty good. They're, their top players are Johnny Wilson, who's also the quarterback on the football team, a big guy inside, Gavin Richards. So they've got uh, some talent. We'll see how they match up with the Jackson Center Tigers. A couple more games real quickly. Fort Laramie, the three seed, gets Cincinnati College Preparatory Academy. We did Fort Laramie earlier in the year. A lot of young guys on their basketball team were getting better all the time. This would be a great experience for them. Big and win finally, over Rucci. Oh, big win big over game. Rucci. Yeah. yeah, that was a big game. We had a couple of SCL teams that matched up. And finally, in Division Three, Versailles will match up with North College Hill. We've talked about Orange all year, the Orange brothers all year long, and how well they're playing. Uh, North College Hill, tremendous basketball tradition down there. And again, this will be a regional game for Versailles and North College Hill in Division Three. And everybody's heard of Arns, the scorer. Yeah. The score in Ohio State. His brother made all league two. A lot of respect for that. A lot of respect for that, okay. yeah. AJ. Hey, let's look at our broadcast schedule. The tournament games coming your way. There you go. Friday night, all over the place. Lots of finals then on the weekend. And uh, Mark and I will be at a couple of different locations. The rest of our announcers will be at the other. Ben Reif has done a great job of setting up the great matchups that we have as we find out who the district champions are and who gets to go to the regionals. And hey, guys, this is our next to last show. Oh, yeah. We will wrap it up next week and let you know who, what girls are going to the state, what boys are going to the regionals, and we'll call it a year. Thanks a lot for joining us. It's been a closer look on WOSN.